Well, I was sharing uh, last week with a few of you out under the tent that uh, the person I worked with last time, uh, our, my senior pastor, he had this giant whiteboard in his room, and that was like, you knew if the whiteboard was empty by th- on Thursday that he was in trouble. Uh, but there was this little note up in the top of the whiteboard that said, don't forget the secret weapon. And the secret weapon was prayer. And so let us join together with that secret weapon that God, we're going to tell God how excited we are to be here. We were just singing songs, telling him that. Uh, we're going to tell him about the things that are stopping us from being here, the things that are bothering us. And uh, we're going to invite him to speak uh, through the words that uh, he's, uh, that's written down in the Bible that we're using today and we're looking at, and uh, through the words that I've prepared. So let's pray together. Creator, we just give thanks for this great day uh, to be here, to worship you uh, in this beautiful place in Prince Edward County, God, in your creation. We sang today about all of creation singing hallelujah. God, we sing it too. But God, we confess that, you know, even though we live in a beautiful place, life isn't always beautiful. And uh, sometimes it gets really busy. We, we just want to pass to you any anxieties, any worries, any busyness, anything that's stopping us from being aware of your presence, God. We're just going to pause, and we're going to hand those things over to you. Help us, Lord, to let go. And God, we pray that your spirit, the spirit that is here amongst us, would work now, would move and open our ears and soften our hearts so we could be ready to take the steps that you are calling us to make. Amen. So last week, I told part of my story. And it was a story for you to understand my calling into ministry. But really, it was a story for you to find yourselves in. A story of what you have been called to do, of what we have been called to do, of what God's calling us as a parish to do right now. And we're left with a question. What is God calling you to do right now as an individual? And what is he calling us as a body to do? What does that do for us as people? We ended with the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, we heard. That's like, go get the work done. I don't know about you, but I've encountered lots of people who are like this. But when my boss gives me a job, I like to get it done so that I can move on, so that I can do the things that I maybe would prefer to do. Maybe you feel that sense of urgency when you have a list of something to do. You want to roll up your sleeves and get down to work. So let's get into today, today's passage for some inspiration and to find something that we can do. And the passage we're reading today comes from Acts 1, 1 to 14. So you, you'll be able to follow along. There's Bibles here. It's also going to be up here on the screen behind me for you from the NIV And uh, it starts like a a letter, so it starts with this introduction. The person who wrote it is writing to a friend. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, 
It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Acts 1, 1 to 14. The, the word of God. It was a fall of 2009, and Mike, a guy I worked with, was the first one I ever heard say, Google it. It never failed. If anyone asked a question about anything, Mike would say, yeah, I'll Google it. You should go look that up. Check Wikipedia. More often than not, he would just tell you to do it than do it yourself. Google had only been around for nine years, and it's already changed our language. It's highlighted our desire to do. For Mike, in order to make a decision, usually on one of the hockey pools he was building, he needed the information in order to act. Google gave him that info. It gave him the stats, the history, the info he needed to make those critical decisions for the future. Well, he thought that the hockey pool was critical anyway. Maybe you feel like Mike. And uh, if you just have the right information, then you, too, can get the job done. This is. So the next spring, what I did with Mike was we worked in tree planting. And Mike had just taken, he'd moved up from a tree planter. You usually do that for two or three years. You learn all the things there are, but then your body tells you, you should not be planting trees anymore. And you uh, move on to jobs that are even harder on your body, but in different ways. And so Mike was taking on the job as a deliverer or a tree runner. Logistically, they're the person that looks at the people that are working. They work with the supervisor to help make sure that everybody gets the trees they need in the place they need them in a timely manner so that everybody can keep working. Well, at the start of the season, you have to train new employees and new deliverers what to do. And often, they'll work alongside more experienced people until they've figured out the ropes. And that was the case at the beginning of May when we went, all went out together and we all delivered a big block of trees where we were going to go and plant them with everybody the next day. But then most of us on management went into town to pick up the 60 tree planters that were arriving to bring them to our camp. And we left Mike behind to set up a few things in camp, but mostly just to relax because as a tree runner, they have one of the hardest jobs. Well... We still had a stash of trees back at camp that needed to be delivered. But the last thing we told Mike was, but don't deliver the trees. We thought that would be enough information for him. But it wasn't. Mike, who just needed to Google it, just needed to have the right information, decided when he was finished setting up the camp that he had the information he needed. He had the maps of the blocks where the trees were going to go. He knew the trees that we had. They were all from the same road. It said so. They were all collected there, the seeds, and then they were grown on. And so Mike worked very hard while we were gone that day, and he delivered another half of 
uh, truck. The work that we had all done together easily, he worked and slaved away, and we didn't know where he was, and we couldn't find him because he hadn't left a note for us. And when he came back, he told us about what he'd done. And he was so excited to tell us. You see, he had the maps of the cut block, and there are going to be some maps that show up on there. The thing about maps is, is that there's a lot of different information on them. So Mike knew from being a tree planter before that I would show him as a crew boss where he could plant. He would see the maps. He would understand those are the cut areas where the trees are going to go. And since so as a new deliverer, he thought, I have all the information that I need. The only problem is we were working in Western Canada in the foothills uh, of the Rocky Mountains. And so you might drive two kilometers down the same road, but you might change in elevation a few hundred feet or a few hundred meters as well. And that had occurred. And so what Mike didn't know, the information that he wasn't paying attention to on the maps was the topography, the change in elevation in between the blocks. And so Mike took trees that were meant to be planted on some of the highest areas, in some of the highest blocks, and he delivered them to the, to the lowest elevation cut blocks. And that may not seem like a big deal, but those trees that grew up higher on the mountain are genetically designed to be higher on the mountain. They wake up later in the spring so they don't get damaged by the frost, and they go to sleep earlier in the fall when they begin to feel those cool temperatures for the same reason. You see, Mike had delivered the trees that were designed for the top of the mountain down here at the bottom. And those trees weren't going to take advantage of the conditions they were given. They were going to shut down earlier in the year. They'd be smaller. They'd grow slower. They weren't designed for that place. Mike did a lot of work that we had to go and redo because he didn't have all the right information. Um, <coughs> have you ever done that? Started to jump in and then not had the right information. Well, in prayer, I wouldn't blame you. In my first year of uh, seminary, uh, we talked about prayer in my first course. It was a prayer uh, um, Sorry, there's a child over here. I'm not used to children coming up th the stairs on the side. Um, where am I? In my first course in seminary, the professor asked the, this question. All these people, they're going to become pastors. They want to become pastors. They felt called by God to work in the church in some way. Who taught you to pray was the question. You know, for me... I can remember my grandmother's soft hands folding over mine. For many people in the room, it was either a grandparent or a parent who taught them. Ironically, nobody else in their entire life had taught them about prayer. And here we were, a room full of future pastors that had learned to pray when we were five and had the understanding of prayer that matched of five-year-olds. The rest we learned and picked up on our own. Nobody taught us along the way. And because of that, people have different experiences of prayer. One group of people will find it to be super life-giving, and they'll spend a lot of time in prayer. Maybe you know one or two people like this. They're the people you call in an emergency. You know that they are going to be praying for you. And it seems like their prayers make a difference. Some of us find it awkward, but we're doing it. It's bulky and challenging. I find myself in this group sometimes. But I do it because, it, you know, when I was growing up, it felt like something to check off of a list. It no longer feels like a checklist item for me, but when I was growing up, that's what prayer felt like a lot of the time. And some people don't even know, is prayer working? That's the question. Maybe you're sitting there. Well, it's okay. The people that were teaching us how to pray learned when they were five, and we've got a long way to grow. You see, the problem when we only learn how to pray in one space from one person is that our prayer life can be very stunted. It's not meant to stay in one place. As Christians, our whole life long, we're called to become more like Jesus each and every day. In order for that to happen, our prayer life has to be one of these aspects that changes and grows. So we have to pray together, and we have to share what we learn so that we can grow 
together. For me, prayer grew more than I could have ever imagined when a spiritual director that first year in seminary invited me to use my imagination. And it was in there, in those prayers that I was led through, gospel contemplation, Lectio Divina. Maybe you've heard these words before, maybe you haven't. It's okay, we're going to do a gospel contemplation later. It was in those prayers that Jesus came alive, and he became a real person. Today, I'm going to invite you to use your imagination, and we're going to do a gospel contemplation of Acts. Now, typically, I would read it once just for you to understand and hear the words, but we've already done that. So now, I'm going to invite you to, if you're comfortable, close your eyes when I read it. And uh, I'm gonna, we're going to pray very briefly at the start. We're going to invite the Spirit to use our imagination. And think of these words, and if you can, imagine them happening like a movie in your mind. You can see the characters. Who's there? Imagine that you can hear the sounds around the people. What might they have been hearing? Think about what type of weather it would have been. You know the story. Let us come together. I've already read it once. Now look. Invite the Spirit to open your eyes so you can see, hear, and smell. This story was recorded by someone who was there or by someone who heard the story straight from one of these disciples. These are their Memories. Heavenly Father, we just invite you into this space. Use our imagination. Help us to be as creative as you are. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God on one occasion while he was eating with them. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Just stay with that for a moment. Now, I'm going to read one more time. And as I do, I'm going to ask you to think of two things. One, where are you in this story? If you were a character, 
Are you watching from above? Are you one of the disciples? Are you somebody watching what's happening to Jesus and his followers? And two, is God, is the Holy Spirit, is Jesus inviting you to do something today, this week, through this time of prayer? In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates. The Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us. I encourage you to, after we're finished, share maybe something that you noticed about that passage that you haven't noticed before through that prayer, or maybe something you noticed in prayer, possibly, from God. Maybe that's something you're like, that was weird. When I've never done that in church before. Um, would love to hear more uh, from you. But prayer... Prayer is what they were called to do in that room by Jesus. Go and wait. You know, a lot of churches around, a lot of pastors that I talk to, churches are waiting. When do we get back to the things that we were doing before? When do we do those things that made us who we were? And we're in a time and a season where we've been forced to pause and to begin again. And I think this is a perfect time for us to do as the disciples did, to go and wait to pray, and to invite God to call us to action instead of choosing the action ourselves. We could run headlong into those ministries that we did before COVID. But instead, let us stop and ask the Spirit to speak boldly and loudly to us. I've got a list of prayers for us to pray together this week, and uh, I'm going to send this out via email, so you don't need to feverishly uh, write this down, but if you want to get this, I would love to be able to send this uh, out to you by email. If you aren't getting our weekly emails or the ones that Brent was sending out before, uh, make sure you give your email to me, but let's pray together this week. I'm inviting you tomorrow, Monday, to ask, where is God leading me? Sometimes in prayer, God just wants you to know that he loves you. 
Uh, sometimes he wants to give us things to change and transform about ourselves. So tomorrow with that email, I'll give you a short, uh, a short um, example of how to do a prayer of examine on your own. It's a way that you introspect over a day or maybe a week of your life and you ask God to reveal one or two events and where he was in that event and how you reacted and whether that was maybe Christ-like or maybe if God wants you to Im act in a different way if that comes up in the future. So Monday, we're going to invite our entire church to pray and ask God, what are you pointing the flashlight on for us this week, God? Tuesday, where has God called me? We all live somewhere. We all have a house. We are all in a place. I'm going to invite you to go for a prayer walk in your neighborhood. That doesn't mean like walking around, uh, speaking out loud to God in your neighborhood, um, although it can be if you would like to do that. Uh, but it does mean walking around your neighborhood and becoming aware of it, giving thanks to God for those beautiful things of creation that are there, for the people that are in place, but also asking God's spirit, can you show me what you want me to do in my neighborhood? How can I invite people that I live next to? How do I invite the people that I work with each day to a life with you? Go for a prayer walk on Tuesday. Let's have our whole church do that together and ask God across our parish, what are you calling us to do? Then Wednesday, local needs. Let's take a look at local news stories and pray for people and leaders in your community. Um, who, in Belleville, in Trenton, uh, in Tyendinaga, Kingston, down here in the county. What is going on? And uh, pray for those leaders that are, have to make uh, the decisions and have to govern us. Uh, pray for the people that live in this geography. On Thursday, we're not meant to do this alone. Uh, I shared, at the, uh, shared that my grandmother taught me how to pray. She's one set of hands that I can say has shaped me and my prayer life with God, but there have been hundreds of people who have shared uh, what their prayer life has been like, what their experiences have been like, and have given me their pieces of prayer so that I can have a more vibrant and rich prayer life. I look forward to learning something new from each one of you about prayer so that my prayer life can grow, and I hope that you also will learn from me uh, things like using gospel contemplation. But pray for your home church if you're already connected to a home church or a small group. Or ask God, who are the three or four people that you are calling me to be in community with? Who am I supposed to be encouraging in their walk with Jesus? And who are you inviting to encourage and challenge me on my walk? Friday uh, is going to be simple silence. So you know, we're asking God a specific set of questions, and as I was making this list, I thought to myself, this is about waiting on God, so let's make sure we have one day where we just wait and listen to God. Set a timer. Maybe you aren't used to sitting in silence. Start with five minutes. Maybe you've done it before. Be more adventurous. Set it to 15. But just sit and be with God. Invite the Spirit to move just to be with you, not to have an agenda. Sometimes that can be tricky if you can't focus uh, in times like that. I encourage you to grab a piece of paper and a pen or your phone. Every time something pops in your head, just make a note so you can forget about it and set it down. And then lastly, on Saturday, uh, we're going to pray together for uh, the leadership of our Sandbanks Parish, the elders, our coordinators, and home church leaders. We're all going to, not all of us, but mo many of us are going to be meeting actually next Saturday uh, and just praying together and connecting and talking more about how and what God is calling us to do here in the community. So we want you to join us in praying uh, for us as a body. So prayer isn't the same every week. You'll notice I've got a different thing every day of the week. I don't wake up at 6 a.m. every day and pray the same prayer every single day. I try to vary it uh, in my own life and use different, different things. And I'm going to send some links to different types of prayers that you can use. Breath prayers, which use a simple verse of scripture. Lectio Divina, which uses a passage similar to the gospel contemplation we did. Different tools for you to use. But please join us this week as we pray together. And we're going to pray now for God to just wrap this up and to invite and challenge us as we go forward. But we have two questions that I would love for you guys to answer to one or two people before you leave here today. One 
is who taught you to pray? And maybe what did you learn from them? My grandmother taught me the steadfastness of prayer and how simple prayers can make a big difference. You see, she prayed simple prayers for her entire family, her kids, her grandkids, and when they came, started to come, her great-grandchildren. She prayed every day that we would have a relationship with God. And her prayers were simple. And she taught me that you don't have to have big words to be able to pray to God, and that's important. And then what is one thing that you have learned that has really helped you to pray? Today I shared that it was my imagination. Before uh, somebody shared uh, the, the, the ability to make a picture in my mind to speak to Jesus, to meet him in scripture the way that we did today, uh, my prayers were more like a, a, a laundry list that I would say to God. And so the imagination and gospel contemplation really opened prayer up for me to be able to encounter Jesus as the living person that he is. So I'd encourage you, answer those two questions with each other. But let's just pray that God would be with us this week as we pray together and that he would move and speak clearly to all of us wherever we are. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks for your presence, your spirit that speaks every day of our lives, that is working in our lives even when we're not aware of it. God, as we look to the future that you're calling us to, as we think about that, the people that you're calling us to serve and help, to introduce to you the work that you have for us to do as your body here, we pray that you would speak and show us where we should act together as individuals, as home churches, as a body, God. I pray that you would give us people this week that could encourage us as we go into these prayers, but also help us to reach out to others, to encourage and challenge them, other people from our community. Join us. Help us to share those things that you're speaking and not keep them hidden. Lord, not our will, Lord. We want your will in this space. We want your will to move amongst us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.